Good morning, Christwalk Church. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We can do a little better than that. There's like two people that are excited about their dad. Yeah, it is um, always a great day when we get to celebrate dads. Um, definitely want to recognize um, all of you that are in the room, those dads that are watching with us um, online this morning. Father's Day is such an important day um, in the life of the church in particular because um, we live in a world where fatherlessness is just a significant issue. And so it's important for us to, to uh, bring commendation to those that are getting it right. And uh, every single week, um, I'm able to interact with a number of the dads that, are, that, that call Christ Walk Church home. And um, th- this, it's, it's just a pleasure to be a part of a group of people um, like that who are seeking to get it right and to be the kind of dad um, that the Lord has called them to be. Uh, just an inspiration to me personally. Many of you have invested in me um, uh, at a significant level. And there's also, um, before we jump into the message today, just something special taking place in our church that a lot of you don't see. And so I want to highlight that um, this morning because uh, in, in, a, in addition to just um, a number of, of great dads working hard to be fathers to their own children. We also have um, a handful of men at our church that are going over and above to make an investment in the next generation. Uh, over the past months, I've observed them being intentional about engaging in conversation with uh, children and teenagers on Sunday morning, just to encourage them and support them and let them know that they are seen and that they are, they are known. Uh, we have um, some youth leaders who regularly open up their home to host uh, our students and, and feed them and just um, engage with them and meet them at their level. We have a, a group of men that are um, actively teaching and, and helping uh, a younger group of men learn how to fish. Uh, we have another group of men that um, they coached a community Little League baseball, game, uh, baseball team together this season. Not because they had any grandkids or kids on the team, but just because they wanted to give back to the community and invest in the next generation. And this is what it looks like to be the church what it looks like to make a difference in people's lives through servanthood and generosity. And so for all the dads that are out there doing that, for all the men that are leading the way, I want to thank you for modeling our values so well and for setting such a great example for the rest of us. So yeah, let's give it up. Let's give it up. Hey, if you got your Bible, you got a smart device, uh, I want to invite you to turn with me or swipe with me to the New Testament. Uh, once again, we are going to Paul's letter uh, to the Colossians, and we'll land in chapter 3 in just a moment. Uh, before we get there, it was the summer of 1995, and I was preparing to begin my freshman year of high school. One of my friends had uh, recently gotten a job as a busboy at our local meet and three in order to save some money for a vacation trip that he wanted to go on with a buddy of his. And one day he told me that they were looking for another busboy and asked if I might be interested. And so I went and turned in an application and in just a couple weeks later, I found myself as the newest employee of the Cream House in Ottawa, Tennessee, making a whopping $4.25 an hour. I was rich. <laughs> Following my first few shifts, as I was covered in mashed potato leftovers and you know, gravy and grease, uh, the news started to wear off, and I came to a startling revelation. Working kind of stinks. And here I was, not even 15 years old yet, just a couple weeks before I turned 15, and I was already beginning to despise the thing that I would end up doing for 80% of the rest of my life. Like, think about it. If, if we were being honest, we tend to focus on the negative aspects of our job considerably more than we do the positive. 
And, and so as a result, working is often viewed as a necessary evil part of our lives, something that we have to do rather than something that we get to do. And perhaps one of the most common ways of expressing our disdain for work comes from the numerous songs that have been written in an attempt to encapsulate our feeling toward our jobs. See if any of these might resonate with your current situation. Maybe the words of Tracy Lawrence who sang, work, 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 day after day, 50-hour week, 40-hour pay. No time to get over all this overtime. Yeah, I'm always running, always running behind. All my life it's been this way. One dollar short and one day late. One rung lower on the ladder I'm trying to climb. If I ever get lucky, if I ever get rich, I'm going to tow my life up out of this ditch and watch the whole world go by while I unwind because I'm always running, always running behind. Maybe you take the, the viewpoint of, of Huey Lewis, who's saying, hey, I'm not complaining because I really need the work. Hitting up my buddies got me feeling like a jerk. $100 car note, 200 rent. I get a check on Friday, but it's already spent. I'm taking what they're giving because I'm working for a living. Maybe you're like Dolly Parton this morning, that you're working nine to five. What a way to make a living. You're barely getting by. It's all taken and no given. They just use your mind and they never give you credit. It's enough to drive you crazy if you let it. Nine to five for service and devotion. You would think that I would deserve a fair promotion. I want to move ahead, but the boss won't seem to let me. I swear sometimes that man is out to get me. Or maybe you are in full-on Johnny Paycheck mode today who said, take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. My woman done left and took all the reason that I was working for. You better not try to stand in my way as I'm walking out the door. Take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. Chances are you can resonate with that today. Here's some alarming statistics about the average American worker and the average American workplace. The average American will spend more than one third of their life working. And you're like, Pastor Blake, I thought this was supposed to be a message full of hope. Why are you bringing us down? We'll spend more than a third of our lives working. The, the average full-time employee in America admits to goofing off on the job more than two hours each day. That, is, that adds up to be 25% of their workday. Nearly 80% of workers feel they are underpaid. Can I get a witness in the house? 44% of workers admit to feeling burnout regularly. Only 33% of workers are optimistic regarding their opportunities for promotion or advancement. Only half of workers, 51%, say that overall they are satisfied with their job. Despite all of this, roughly 40% of workers say that their job or their career is significant to their identity. Think about it. When you meet somebody for the first time, one of the probably top three questions that you will ask them is, so what do you do? We find our identity in our jobs. And so if, if our jobs, if the work that we do is such a central and integral part of our lives, even connected in with who we are as a person, then why is it that we feel the way that we do about them? I can't help but wonder, is it possible that we struggle with our jobs or just the, the concept of working in general because we simply have the wrong mindset or attitude toward them? You know, a lot of us, if we want to think about it in theological or, or biblical terms, we, want to, we blame the fall for the difficulty of our jobs. Remember, because Adam and Eve sinned, part of the punishment was that, that work, that, that they were going to have to work by the sweat of their brow, that it was going to be difficult. But if you think about it, that's not where work began. Work actually began at the beginning when God established 
all of creation. And he set the example of what proper work looks like to work hard and to do good or very good and then to rest. That is the example that was set for us. And so this morning, I, I want to propose a different perspective that our work is more than simply a necessary evil in our lives, but rather our work is directly connected to both our worship and our witness. So this morning, I'd like for you to consider if, if you were to view your work in light of your worship and your witness, is there anything that you would need to be doing differently? And now, uh, initially, you may want to push back against that. Perhaps you're, you're one of the many that would suggest that your job is merely a part of your secular life and that it is fully separate, it is fully compartmentalized away from that which is sacred. But according to the Apostle Paul, there is no difference between the secular and the sacred in the life of the believer. For the believer in Jesus, it is all sacred. It's what we talked about a, a few weeks ago in Colossians 3.17 when Paul wrote, And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. What Paul is saying is that whether we show up in a corner office or whether we are cleaning toilets and everywhere in between, that our work exists for us to honor our Heavenly Father. It is a part of our worship and a part of our witness. And so the question for us becomes, what do we need to do to handle our professional lives in a way that honors God by way of both our worship and our witness? Today, we're continuing our message series, Supreme, where we've been systematically working through Paul's letter to the Colossians. And in this letter, Paul establishes both theological and doctrinal foundations for the supremacy of Christ. As a result of his supremacy, the believer in Jesus is, is mandated to live their lives differently. And Paul highlights a, a number of the ways we are to go about this, both in general and then, as we learned last week, in specific ways as well. Last week's message, we talked about our response to the supremacy of Christ and the way that we conduct our personal lives, how we manage our household, our marriage, our parenting. And for the next few minutes today, I want to talk about our response to the supremacy of Christ and the way that we conduct our professional lives, specifically in the area of the employer-employee relationship. And so Colossians chapter 3, hopefully you're there. Uh, we're going to start in verse 22. We're going to read all the way through the end of the chapter and then the first verse of chapter 4. Picking up in verse 22, Paul writes this, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done, for God has no favorites. Chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Now, before we get into kind of the explanation, we break down this text, I want to first address the elephant in the room. There's some uncomfortable language in this passage talking about slaves and masters. And so um, there's, there's a lot of pushback from a lot of people when it comes to this concept of slavery in the Bible. But I'd like to note up front that it is quite different than what we think in terms of modern day slavery. Our modern day slavery is race driven. It is ultimately the, the white man who is enslaving the black man. But here in the Bible, slavery is not race-driven. Rather, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, slavery uh, that we find in the scriptures is primarily based on economics. 
It's also important to note that the Bible does condemn what uh, is a concept referred to as men stealing or kidnapping, both in Deuteronomy 15 and uh, Exodus 21. And it says that these things are to be punished even by death. From a Jewish perspective, uh, perspective of, of slavery, it would be something akin to an indentured servant that, that when someone Someone owed uh, a debt to another person. They couldn't just go down to the bank and, and pull out money. They couldn't uh, get a loan or anything. So often they would have to sell themselves into slavery to pay off that debt that they owed. But from that Jewish perspective, the slave could only work for up to six years before they would be released on their seventh year from their debt. And not only would they be released back into their freedom, but their master would give them money and property and livestock to help establish them as they re-entered society as a free person. Then we have, uh, shifting to kind of the New Testament, we have this Roman perspective. And the Roman perspective of slavery is that, that um, people like uh, lawyers and politicians and doctors, even uh, some scholars believe that Luke, who was a doctor, he wrote the book of Luke and then the book of Acts, that, that he was a slave to Theophilus, who he wrote those books to, that that doctors and lawyers and politicians and the like, that they were slaves, but they were also considered to be part of the family. And that it was, uh, in, in result, it was also part of a repayment of debt, or perhaps they were born into slavery as a part of that family. And so widespread on the whole, the Bible neither... Uh, overtly and directly condemns nor condones slavery. It simply acknowledges it as part of the culture of the day and the people to which and for whom it was written. But see, it's important for us to note that the Bible is not a book about the culture. The Bible is a book about a savior. And so as long as there are sinful men in existence, there will be corruption within the culture in which they exist. But the good news of the Bible is that Christ came to free us from the grip and bondage of sin. Christ came to change men's hearts. And see, I've heard it said that the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart, and that the Bible does address head on. There's another letter of the Apostle Paul's uh, known as Philemon. And Philemon was a slave owner himself. Uh, one of the slaves that he owned uh, is a man by the name of Onesimus. And Onesimus uh, likely delivered uh, this letter of Paul's to the Colossians. But in the, in the letter to Philemon, we learn that Onesimus, that he had run away um, from his, his master. He had run away from Philemon, and uh, he goes to Rome, and he interacts with Paul. And so Paul encourages um, uh, uh, Onesimus to go back to Philemon. And in return, he actually writes a letter to Philemon explaining his interaction with Onesimus. And in that letter, Paul encourages Philemon to receive Onesimus back as a brother in Christ rather than a slave. And Paul goes over and above saying that anything that Onesimus might owe as a result of his running away or as a result of the debt that he was trying to pay back to Philemon, that, that Philemon could put it on Paul's tab and that he would cover the cost. So uh, the big picture when we're talking about slaves and masters in light of the scriptures is that uh, we know that in Christ there is neither slave nor free. What that means is that regardless of who we are or where we come from, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And so that is the important thing for us to keep at the forefront. And so for our purposes today, as we kind of move into this modern era, when, uh, um, when we talk about slaves, I want you to think employee. And when we talk about masters, I want you to think employer. Those are the ways that we are going to in approach this passage today within the context that it would apply to us 
this morning. And so for the next few minutes, if you're taking notes, I want to uh, talk about some guidelines for the workplace, godly guidelines for the workplace. And that begins first with um, Paul establishing the responsibility of the employee. The responsibility of the employee, verses 22 and 23. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Paul is pretty straightforward here in these, in these guidelines, these responsibilities, and what he is communicating to us. And he begins, the, the first guideline, he says that, that employees, we are, we are to obey our employer. We are to obey our employer. The, the Greek word that's used here in the original, um, the, the original language is, uh, means one who answers the door when it is knocked upon. It's what obedience is, is that when, when the door gets knocked on, it's the, the one who comes to answer. Is that the kind of employee that we are, that, that when our boss, when, when our employer is, is knocking on the door, are we the one stepping up? Are we the one rising to the occasion to do what they are asking of us? That's what obedience means. It means that we, we do what they tell us to do. A lot of times we want to say, or we, we have the attitude of, but wait a minute, that thing that they're asking me to do, that's not my job. It's important for us to remember that, that often the goal is more important than the role. And so we, we need to go back to, there, there's a clause in, in our job descriptions. It's usually the last thing down at the bottom. It is the anything deemed necessary clause. Yes, like you were hired for this, but then there's also this because the goal, the end result is more important than the role. And so what ultimately what Paul is saying here is that when it comes to obedience of, uh, of the employee to the employer, that we need to take the attitude of, I can do that. I can do that. What needs to be done? Oh, I can do that. You need that? Oh, I can do that. I can take care of that. I can do that. I'm happy to do that. I'll do that. That's the kind of people that we need to be. And the only caveat here is, is that, that um, and, unless our employers are, are pointing us into some kind of sin, some sort of unethical or immoral behavior that would cause us to sin. Otherwise, we need to be the people stepping up to answer the door when it is knocked on saying, I can do that. I'm here, I'm ready, because we are to obey our employer. We're also uh, meant to please our employer. And Paul says, not just when they are watching us. We've heard it said, when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? Or perhaps uh, maybe we take on the attitude of, hey, here they come, look busy. And then we're on our computer, you know, like typing up, you know, like, we're working hard. We're going to, oh, we're doing it. And then as soon as they're gone, we're back to, you know, Minesweeper or Solitaire or whatever it is. Here's a question to consider. If, if your boss knew how you spent your time on the clock, would they approve? If they knew the ins and outs, the, the finite details of how you spent your time on the clock, would they approve? And our initial response is, well, well, uh, uh, so-and-so doesn't work that hard either. The person in the cubicle, you know, I work way harder than them. They're always goofing off and everything, and, and they get away with it. So why shouldn't I be able to? Here's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. He says, pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. What he's saying there is you set the example. You set the tone. You create the standard. You do it for you. And, and then raise the bar for everyone else. It's not about them. It's about you. Obey your employer. Please your employer. The number four thing, the command that, that Paul gives us here is that we are to serve our employer. He says that we're to serve them sincerely. This is, uh, uh, in the original Greek, it, it literally means singleness of heart. 
It means not being self-seeking. It communicates this idea of looking out for you versus looking out for your boss. Which one is it going to be? He says, we need to look out for our employer and the overall welfare of the company. I, I recently saw a bumper sticker on the back of a, of a vehicle that said, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. And for a vast portion of our workforce, that is the best reason that they can muster for doing their job each day. But a significant and often overlooked way that we can serve God is in our everyday tasks, the things that we perform at work. Martin Luther understood this when he wrote, The maid who sweeps her kitchen is doing the will of God just as much as the monk who prays. Not because she may sing a Christian hymn as she sweeps, but because God loves clean floors. The Christian shoemaker does his Christian duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes, because God is interested in good craftsmanship. See, when we do our jobs well, when we serve our employer sincerely, seeking the benefit of them and, and the well-being of the company, of the, the larger part of what we are about, we, we end up honoring God in the long run as well. Do a good job because we serve them sincerely. Final thing that, that Paul admonishes the employer in this section is he says, you also need to work willingly for your employer. Work willingly. This points back to verse 17, which says, whatever you do or say, do as a representative of Jesus. To work willingly means to do it Heartily, it is, uh, it's, it's the, the, the core central of our vitality. It is the seat of our feelings, desires, and affections of the heart and soul. One place that gets this right above all of the rest is Chick-fil-A. What do they say? Anytime you thank them for something or ask them for something or, or uh, demand something of them, what do the, employers, the employees say? It's my pleasure. So you know, they do it so well that you know what it is. This is what it looks like to work willingly. It's what it looks like to do things heartily, that it is my pleasure. I'm taking pleasure in my work. It is my pleasure. That's the attitude that we should have. So if you can't do these things, or if you won't do these things, you've got two options this morning. Two options if you can't or won't do these things. First option is change your heart. Second option is change your job. Those are the two choices you have. Either change your heart or change your job. Otherwise, you are living in sin. And by dishonoring your place of employment and your employer, you are dishonoring God in the long run as well. So those are the responsibilities of the employer. There's also a reminder to, or the, the responsibilities of the employee. There's also a reminder to the employee that is given in verse 24. Paul says, remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. Christ is your reward and inheritance, not the paycheck that you're working for. And that's where a lot of us have gotten it wrong because we work for the paycheck because that is the, the immediate gratification that we have. But in the bigger picture, what we see here is that, that slaves, to which Paul was originally writing, they would have had no rights of any sort to any sort of inheritance. And so Paul is flipping the script here. He's saying all of this work that you're doing, it's actually for an inheritance. It's actually for a reward, but it's not financial gain. It's not something that is just uh, temporary. It's not just a worldly benefit. No, that's a good thing. It shouldn't be the focus for us. Instead, what Paul is saying, the reward or the inheritance of Jesus that we receive is eternal life and the blessings of heaven. That's what we have to look forward to by being a model employee and living our lives according to this standard. 
Paul also reminds us that Christ is our master. And so when we serve our employer, guess what we're also doing? We're serving Christ. That we are a representative of Christ to our employer and our co-workers through the, the actions and attitudes of servanthood and honor and sacrifice. And I realize that there are a lot of people in the room, a lot of people watching with us online, that, that your, your work situation is difficult. You work with and for probably some unbelievers, maybe some really difficult people to get along with. My question would be, what does your attitude and your work ethic communicate to an unbelieving boss or unbelieving co-workers about what it means to be a Christ follower? It's what we need to take into consideration because as employees, we have responsibilities and guidelines for us to follow. There's also responsibilities that are on the, uh, the, the life and the, the expectations of the employer and Chapter 4, verse 1, we're going to skip 25, we'll come back to it. But chapter 4, verse 1, Paul begins and says, Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Now, uh, full disclosure and vulnerability, one of the most challenging parts for me in pastoring our church is leading our staff. Not so much because they are difficult people, but because uh, almost seven years in now, all I know is, is that there's a whole lot that I still don't know. And so I'm trying to learn. See, I have a degree, a college degree in pastoral ministry. And, and they told me when I graduated, you are equipped to pastor a church. But I never took one class on budgeting. I never was taught about salaries and benefits. Human resources was not part of my course requirements. And admittedly, at 20 years old, I, I, I was not sitting in the classroom considering the, uh, the, the business side of things like staff meetings and things of that nature. Instead, I took some Bible and theology courses, and they handed me a Bible and patted me on the back and said, go for it. And so I realized that I'm the lid. And I'm constantly asking questions to learn and get better. I realize that there is a difficulty, there is a tension that comes along with being the boss, the employer, and leading other people as part of a staff. And thank God that these things are addressed in the scriptures. So Paul says the requirements of the employer is, first, we need to be just. We need to be just. This literally means righteous. It's talking about that which is approved and acceptable by God. That we need to conduct our business practices and dealings morally and ethically in order to position our employees for success. We do right by our employees because, guess what? God has done right by us, and so we need to be just. We also need to be fair. He says, this is being equitable, that we give them the best or we treat them well because Christ has given us his best and has treated us well. So this means that we do everything in our power to cultivate a positive work environment and to make sure that our employees are cared for. We provide reasonable compensation. We give them respect and dignity. That we provide opportunity for growth and advancement within the company. That we work to support a work-life balance in uh, the lives of our employees. That we cultivate safety within our workplace, physically, emotionally, mentally, and so on. That we value feedback from those that we work for and work with. And that, that at the, from the top down, we do our best to lead by example. Those are some practical nuts and bolts of how we can begin to live and operate if we want to model this sort of thing in front of our employees and bring it into our work relationships. Those are the requirements there's also a reminder to the employer. Not only does he say, masters, be just and fair to your slaves, but remember that you also have a master in heaven. Guess what? You are not the end-all, be-all. Christ is your master. 
And so what that means is that when you lead your employees, it should mirror the leadership of Christ through the attitudes and actions of, you guessed it, servanthood, honor, and sacrifice. That you are not to be driven by profit margins and the bottom line, but instead by kingdom purposes. That you are a representative of Christ to your employees. And no doubt, many of you who find yourself in the employer seat, you work with some people. You have some people that, are, that, 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 that answer to you that they're not believers. And so my question for you would be, what does the way that you lead communicate to unbelievers, those that you employ or oversee? What does that communicate to them about the person and work of Jesus Christ and who he is? Some heavy stuff that we're dealing with. And there's responsibilities and, and reminders that Paul gives. And then in verse 25, there's, he, he, he underscores some ramifications for both employees and employers. He says, but if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done. For God has no favorites. That means that whether we are an employee or whether we are an employer, there is no difference with God. Remember, there, there's neither slave nor free. We are all the same. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And so ultimately what Paul is saying here, this is kind of the, the, the hinge point that connects the employee and the employer together in terms of our responsibilities and requirements, is that, that, that God isn't so much concerned with our role, our title, or our position as much as he is with our work ethic and behavior. And one of our core values as a church is honor, that, that we honor up, down, and sideways. And that's how it should work in our working environments as well, not just within the four walls of our church. And so to employees who, who feel that they are deserving of a promotion or a pay raise, the question is, how does your current attitude and work ethic line up with that? To the employer who wishes that their employees would take things more seriously or just work harder at their job. How are you leading that way by example? Because at the end of the day, we get what we give. And so if you don't like what you're getting out, it might be time to evaluate what you're putting in. Because at the end of the day, here's the truth. As believers, as Christ followers, we should be model employers or model employees. As, as Christ followers in, in the community, we should be the one that everyone wants to work for. Or we should be the one that everyone wants us to work for them. We should be the worker in our job, in our workplace, that everyone else aspires to be like. If you were really to get down to the nitty gritty of that, is, is that the case? Is that the case in your work environment today? And so when, when you view your work in light of worship and witness, what needs to change? What needs to change? In, in regard to what Paul has communicated here to us, what, what aspect of your professional life is standing in the way of you honoring God? Is it, is it laziness? Is it a bad attitude? Is it maybe harsh words that you're constantly throwing on other people? Maybe it's water cooler gossip. The list could go on and on. The Holy Spirit is convicting some people right now. And so the action step from this point forward is, what are you going to do to fix it? What can you do this week to begin moving that in a direction that aligns with God and his word and brings him honor and glory in the workplace regardless of the role that you play and the position that you have? And then what might happen? What could happen if you and I begin to make these adjustment, adjustments? Instead of the, the, the disdain that we feel for our workplace and the ooh kind of feeling when talking about our boss or the things that we got to do and everything. What if we could replace that with happiness and joy instead? Wouldn't that be better? 
if we did these things, wouldn't it lead to being more productive? Wouldn't it lead to being more fulfilled in our jobs? Wouldn't it lead to better working relationships? Wouldn't it uh, uh, ultimately lead to a more positive outlook toward our jobs and our places of employment and the people that we work with? And at the end of the day, Paul says that, that if we will do all these things, that God is going to be glorified. Isn't that how we should choose to live? The pattern is there. The example has been put forth, and the ball is in our court. What kind of outcome do we want to have? The choice is up to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the power and the principle of your word, Lord, that, that there is no stone left unturned, but that you get down into the specific parts of our lives, the things that every single person has to deal with and navigate and that you teach us how to live. Father, I pray that you would help us to make the hard choices, the difficult changes, to do the things that we need to do so that we can bring our lives in complete and total alignment with your word. Lord, that we would go forth from this place and that as we engage in our workplaces, over the course of this next week and beyond. Lord, be it as employers or employees, whatever role we play, whatever title that we have, Lord, that we would be a people that would model these principles and that would live and work in accordance with these guidelines. And as a result, Lord, I pray that you would bring blessing to your people. Lord, that you would cause their businesses, their companies, their work relationships, their pro productivity, their opportunities for advancement, that you would cause all of those things to thrive. And that in and through their lives, in and through their behavior and their work ethic, Lord, that they would bring honor to you as they honor their boss, as they honor their coworkers. That they would bring honor to you and that you would be glorified in and through their work. That it wouldn't be something that they have to do, but it would be something that we get to do, and that through our work, Lord, that we would worship you, and that, that we would witness to others about Jesus. It's in, these, in your mighty name that, that we pray all of these things. In Jesus' name, the church said, amen, amen.